I've been asked to um, give an overview of the different emotion theories and uh, what they have to say about mixed emotions, which you'll see is not a whole lot. Um, okay, there's four basic kinds of theories of emotions out there and quite a bit of overlap among them. And the overlap is actually growing as uh, people modify their uh, extreme original positions to uh, take account of uh, what other people are saying. They are categorical theories, dimensional theories, constructivist theories, and uh, appraisal theories. Uh, categorical theories um, in modern times began with Darwin. I thought you would like, might like to see Darwin as a younger person than he usually is. And um, is uh, uh, Paul Ekman's theory is perhaps uh, the most well known. Um, according to this, uh, these are Ekman's faces. Um, and the original idea was that there are separate neural programs for discrete, categorically distinct emotions. So Sylvan Tompkins' theory had nine, Izzard had, Carol Izzard had 10, Ekman is known for six, although he tried very, very hard to expand that to seven, but nobody remembers that, uh, and others have uh, a few more. Um, so the idea is that here you have uh, anger, fear, disgust, surprise, happiness, and sadness. And the facial expression data was uh, the, uh, uh, the data that really uh, got this theory a lot of attention. Um, several problems with uh, categorical theories. One is that we almost all believe that there's a lot more emotions than six or even 10. And what does the, how do the categorical theories deal with uh, um, all of the uh, emotions that don't fit into any of those categories? Uh, secondly, it's a purely nominal arrangement uh, that, of discrete categories. So there's nothing about similarities or differences among emotions. Um, uh, but we feel that uh, surprise is actually fairly close to fear. Um, and happiness is the opposite of sadness. And uh, nothing about these uh, uh, similarities and differences among emotions is, can be easily handled by a purely categorical theory. Um, and likewise, nothing is said about how you move from one emotion to another. Uh, does one program shut down and then the other one uh, burst into life, or how does that work? Um, okay, dimensional theories have been around um, uh, almost contemporaneously with Darwin, and there you have Wilhelm Wundt as uh, one of the originators of these theories, and now uh, James Russell is uh, perhaps uh, the major proponent, but there are lots of people who've had dimensional theories. Um, most of them have been three-dimensional or more, but only the first two dimensions have been the same. So the, basically, uh, two-dimensional theories say that you have uh, on the horizontal axis, axis an emotion can range from unpleasant to pleasant or negative to positive, and then you can go from very low arousal to very high arousal. Um, Okay, as I said, most theorists had another dimension or two more dimensions, but there was no agreement among them about uh, further dimensions. Um, these theories allow an infinite number of emotions, not just six or 10. Uh, you can name any emotional state and uh, rate it for activation and pleasantness and it'll fit on that circle somewhere. Um, transitions are easy to account for uh, you're just moving around along the dimensions from one state to another. Uh, so being a little more aroused will change your emotion. Being a little more positive or a little more negative will change your emotion. 
Uh, okay, so the problems with two-dimensional theories um, are, uh, first of all, most of the interesting emotions are in uh, the same place. So if you look at the uh, upper, from your point of view, left-hand quadrant, uh, you see that fear, anger, and disgust are practically on top of each other. On the other hand, at the bottom of the dimensional uh, arrangement, you see um, there really aren't enough emotions. There are emotions that don't seem that different, filling up the whole bottom quadrant. So uh, the distance between lethargic and contented is about the same as the distance between elated and disgusted, and yet we feel that there are many, many different emotions in the top half and not a lot of differences in the bottom half. Um, okay, thirdly, uh, many emotions we feel can, can be high or low on arousal. So to say that uh, anger is basically a high arousal emotion uh, causes many people some problems because you can imagine being mildly pissed or furious, right? All within the anger dimension. And likewise, to say that sad is low arousal, you can go from uh, slight sadness to complete anguish. Um, okay, so uh, uh, the third point of view are the constructivist theories, and these basically started with uh, Stanley Schachter um, with uh, uh, research sh where he just proposed that physiologically there's nothing but high arousal and low arousal. When you're aroused, you look around your situation and you decide what you're feeling on the basis of the context. And for Schachter, uh, the context was mostly what other people around you were feeling. Uh, today, Lisa Feldman Barrett is probably the major uh, proponent of constructivist theories. Notice that constructivist theories are dimensional theories, that you have for Schachter uh, the dimension of arousal plus an interpretation. For Feldman Barrett, the dimension of arousal plus the dimension of positive negative, just like uh, Russell and the two-dimensional theories, and then you interpret it. You look around your environment and you say, what am I feeling, based on the context. Um, so say you're feeling uh, pleasant and aroused, and you look around the context, and uh, you decide what you're feeling. Okay, the problem with constructivist theories is, here's the context. What is the person feeling? There's an awful lot going on. You don't uh, actually get to the feeling um, by just having this huge concept of the context. Um, okay, so basically the details of the construction, how you construct, are very vague and therefore there's no clear predictions. Okay, and the final one on which I'll spend too much time because it's mine is uh, uh, appraisal theories. And they were started about simultaneously but unaware of each other um, by Klaus Scherer and uh, by me. Um, okay, appraisal theories basically argue that you have elicitors out in the world and you look at your world and you uh, appraise what's happening there. A, a, along certain dimensions, which I'll mention in a minute. These appraisals go with, correspond to bodily responses, subjective feelings, and action tendencies. Um, and they then, what's actually expressed is controlled by cultural and individual rules. Uh, and finally, you get expressive behavior or instrumental behavior. You'll see appraisal theory is a constructivist theory, but it tries to say um, what it is about situations that matter in differentiating emotions. And uh, these are, the first step is something new happens. There's a change, there's novelty, and it grabs your attention. Um, if uh, then you may notice, no, that terrible noise was just 
uh, the dishwasher turning on, and then you get out of the emotion system altogether. It's not interesting. Uh, almost simultaneously with attention, you decide whether the situation is positive or negative. Or you don't. I mean, this is where mixed emotions might come in. Um, and then you, you appraise it for how certain you feel wh about what's happening, uh, who or what caused it, am I at fault, are you at fault, or is it just fate, the situation, circumstances beyond anybody's control. This makes a big difference, especially for the negative emotions. Uh, how relevant is it to attaining whatever goal you have in mind, um, and how much effort do you have to put in to get that goal? And finally, uh, Shearer added one, a sort of moral dimension, is how consistent is it with your values? Uh, the same thing happens on the positive side, but positive emotions across a lot of research turn out to be less differentiated. You can differentiate, but you're feeling great. You know, you don't care that much about um, what exact nuance of greatness you're feeling. Uh, okay, so the first step, I, I got through this quite quickly, uh, but uh, uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. The first step is attention. Um, this is sort of the gateway to emotion, and you can see that uh, something has grabbed these ladies' attention, and you can also see in their faces that the next appraisal is going to be a little different. Somebody may be slightly <coughs> outraged, somebody may be uh, just a little suspicious, and finally the lady in the back looks as though she might giggle. Um, <laughs> so there might be some positive there. Appraisal theory says that what emotions are, are combinations of appraisals. Um, so, uh, if in fear you have very high attention, it's negative, very high uncertainty, and low control. You'll notice that this is very like hope, which has all the same appraisals except for negative. And it's very easy, according to the theory, then to switch between fear and hope, because only one appraisal dimension has to change. So. Uh, it, the theory does say something about similarities and differences in emotions. Anger, then, is high attention, negative. Very strong perception that somebody else is at fault. Quite high certainty and uh, a, sense, a high sense of control. Um, there are, of course, many, many flavors of fear, of anger. I mean, as any appraisal changes a little bit, so does the subjective experience of emotion. And uh, women, in fact, often report not quite such a high sense of control when they're talking about their anger experiences. Sadness, then, high attention, negative again. Here, you tend to think it's not anybody's fault, it's circumstances, there's nothing can, to be done about it, and you feel very low control. Um, Okay, so the features of a, you know, appraisal theory has features, not problems, you, uh, right? <laughs> uh, is that emotion is a process, not a state. There are no discrete states. It's just constant shifting and changing of appraisals, and so the emotional experience. Um, so there are an infinite number of emotions, not four or six or ten. And the transitions among emotions will be faster when they share many appraisals. Okay, so let's get to mixed emotions. If you have a categorical theory, people talk about blends. Um, if you believe in discrete emotions, um, the idea of mixing makes sense because you have emotion A, and emotion B, and if you mix them, you'll feel a mixed emotion. Um, this follows naturally from categorical theories and not from the others. But these theorists never actually talked about the experience of mixed emotions. Um, they talked a lot about blends, that's how they got to all of the emotions that weren't in the six or ten, but the blends were not the experience of 
a mixed emotion. So uh, these may make no sense to you as they don't to me, but uh, these are uh, Pluchik's uh, blends of anger and joy, that is pride. So the mixed emotion was not a mixed emotion, but just another unitary emotion in the way that the categorical theorists talked about it. Uh, and you know, the farther you go down the list, the weirder it may look to you, uh, but that is what somebody said. Um, it's how they dealt with the problem that th there's more than six emotions. Okay, for the dimensional theorists, the problem is that uh, you don't have anything to mix, that emotions are like the color spectrum, only in many more dim dimensions, um, and all emotions, in a way, are a mixture of the underlying appraisals, positive, negative, and arousal, or the, the more appraisals that are in appraisal theory. So if you change an appraisal, you'll change the emotional experience. And so it's hard to say what a mixed, a mixed emotion would mean with a model like this. Okay, but we can't get off the hook entirely. You can still ask, um, can a person be at two different points on the same dimension? Um, and uh, sequentially, Yes, of course. I mean, I can feel positive one minute and negative uh, the next second. Simultaneously, that's harder. Can, for novelty, can I feel that something's familiar and unfamiliar at the same time? Maybe, that's deja vu. Um, for valence, many emotional situations are very complex, but, um, and have both good and bad features to them, but we get back to the Jeff Larson question, are they really simultaneous? Or is it rapid alternation uh, between them? Um, for arousal, it's very hard for me to imagine an emotion that's both high arousal and low arousal, but you may have better imaginations than I do. Agency, quite easy, that I can see both you and me as at fault for something. Or you caused it, but you know, you're sort of mentally defective and it wasn't really your fault, fault in the same way. Um, uh, okay, and then finally, does it matter if they're yeah, really simultaneous or if they're sequential? Um, for the brain, I think yes, that what's happening in the brain is do you have two separate programs firing or do you have a rapid alternation? For subjective experience, I'm not so sure. Whenever we label our emotions, memory is involved, and it may be impossible to differentiate a really simultaneous experience from a really rapid alternation. So the visual analogy would be we have a clear perception, a unified experience, but in fact, if this is in a newspaper, it might be a lot of little discrete uh, events. And if we make, turn the analogy to the temporal analogy, the same thing may be true of mixed emotions. Okay, I'm going to say one more thing, which has nothing to do with the rest of the talk, uh, but it's about the way people talk about complex emotions. Um, and I'm mentioning it because Igor Grossman and I have a new paper out about this, which is uh, on file with the conference. Uh, in which we look at the various ways people have discussed mixed emotions. Some people talk about them dialectically, which basically means positive and negative at the same time. Some people talk about them in terms of how many nuanced emotions they are. Some people over time and some people at the same time. And the measures are different and uh, people haven't always um, made a clear distinction. So if you see this as uh, emotions over time, the top line is a pretty undifferentiated person. Blue, 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 one yellow, a couple more blues. Second one is a dialectically more diverse person, more mixed, so that you have po negative, positive, negative, positive. So this is dialecticism across time. The third row is what uh, is emotional differentiation. So it's not about positive and negative, but how many just different kinds of things. I'm anxious, I'm perturbed, I'm sad, I'm 
a bunch of different emotions. Uh, and this is done by saying, uh, what emotions did you feel during the past week, month, etc.? A lot of research using this technique. The other is, um, what emotions do you feel at the same time? So a dialecticism one would be positive and negative at the same time. A differentiated uh, view would be just lots of little nuances. Uh, so that I ask you what you're feeling right now and you tell me four things rather than one thing or two things. Um, and as I said, uh, people haven't really focused on these distinctions, but they've led to different methods um, and different conclusions about uh, mixed emotions. And that's all. Thank you.